My name is Mickey Riley. I'm the chief engineer at Comco in Burbank, California. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about how to uh, specify, control, analyze everything you need to know about microblasted surface finishes. So first we'll talk about who Comco is, and then I'll show you what these microblasted surfaces are that I'm talking about. Um, and once you have an idea of how you want to use it, you need to make sure that you can actually quantify that surface, how to specify it on a drawing, and then in production, how to make sure that you get that same surface again and again. So Comco manufactures what I like to describe as the love child between a sandblaster and a laser. It's a very precise, high precision, abrasive stream. Uh, the picture on the left there is a manual station. Um, that's a very high accuracy blaster and a self-contained dust collector that uh, you can use by hand. Sometimes the operator is the main source of error, so you need automation, and that's what you see there on the right. Uh, that's a typical lathe application. Uh, we call our four-axis CNC platform a lathe, even though it has X, Y, and Z as well. The main difference between a microblaster and a traditional blaster is how it mixes the air and abrasive. So in the bottom, you see your traditional cabinet blaster. You're going to have an air line coming in through the back of the handpiece and a siphon tube that goes down into a drum of, or a pot or a recycled um, bin of abrasive. And that doesn't feed abrasive particularly consistently, and you're pretty much limited to your pressures as well because it's relying on venturi. Uh, in a pressure pot system, of which microblasting is a subset, the mixture of air and abrasive is made at pressure. Uh, and the, the thing that really separates microblaster from the other pressure pot systems is that we are separately feeding abrasive into the airstream, and the two are decoupled as much as possible. So you can get a very accurate, repeatable abrasive stream. So what are these microblasted surface finishes? They typically fall into two categories. Um, grit blasted, which on a macro scale, imagine you took a bunch of ax heads and you threw it at uh, a big metal plate. It's going to leave a lot of gashes and wounds in that surface. Uh, that, that's a grit blasted type of surface. Um, the other main type is a bead blasted surface. So if, imagine you took that same metal plate and you hit it with a ball peen hammer a bunch of times. It's going to leave an orange peel type of texture. Now when you start talking about brittle materials, um, brittle materials react to grit blasting much the same way ductile materials do, provided they're a homogeneous um, brittle material. Uh, if it's something like glass, it's going to respond very much like it would if it was metal. If it's something like a sintered carbide where you have a whole bunch of small particles that have been pressed together either with the binder or without, then the fracture mechanics between those particles starts to come into play. Uh, and you can see from the bottom right picture that uh, on bead blasting a brittle surface is essentially a lost cause. The abrasive will hit that surface and usually bounce off. Once you have enough energy, it'll compress that layer, and then the layer will just explode out and you'll get these craters. So there's three fundamentals we're going to cover. That was shape. The next one is height and density. So how do you characterize the, the height of the surface? And that's just from peak to valley, or maybe you want to go from midline to peak or midline to average. There's a number of different ways that can be done. Um, and the other characteristic that you can quantify is how, what's the frequency? How, how close together are those peaks? And then lastly, is a, uh, a function is nano features. So imagine in this sawtooth pattern here that the valleys that were created last were created by the last abrasive impact. And the subsequent abrasive impacts, because this is a ductile material, haven't been completely erased. So you'll get these little leftover um, features that we call nano features, and those have an interplay um, when you're trying to do things like osseo integration um, or inhibiting bacteria growth on medical implants. So some typical examples in the medical arena, probably the most simple to understand is on the left there. Uh, a customer wants to overmold a plastic piece onto a stainless steel tube. Well, a stainless steel tube starts off pretty smooth. You need to make it just mechanically rougher so that the plastic has some peaks and valleys around which it can flow and grab onto. In that case, the, the, the shape of the abrasive mattered, or the shape of the features mattered, and the height of the features mattered, but maybe not the peak spacing. Uh, the pacemaker you see on the right, uh, customers will use the blast to add a nice even matte finish to the outside of it, uh, or more interestingly, in this case here, the nozzle's being used to get rid of over-molded plastic from where the header was molded onto the can. On the left here, we see a uh, stent, a nitinol stent on the left. Uh, nitinol is, usually starts its life as a small tube 
Uh, it's laser cut, which introduces uh, these vertical lines you can see in the upper left picture um, and leaves some slag. It, it's generally a relatively messy process. Um, and then when you heat set these things to get them to stay in their permanent shape, uh, that builds an oxide layer. So microblasting is used to remove the oxide layer and those laser pulse marks without uh, affecting the underlying titanium uh, uh, nitinol layer. And you end up with a very nice, even surface texture, which then for the subsequent electropolish step, which is typical, uh, electropolish works very effectively on. Uh, dental implant is what you see on the right. It usually starts from a, a titanium bar stock. It's machined. And then the uh, manufacturers put on a very specialized surface roughness. And this is kind of the core of the discussion today. That surface roughness is not only specified in how rough it is, how close the peaks are together, but those nano features start to play in. Uh, the nano features will affect how well the osseons and your bones want to actually adhere and grow to the implant. Um, and they also impact how there's a mechanical relationship between the bacteria trying to grow to it, which you don't want, um, and it, it, it repels bacteria. That's actually a study that's ongoing right now with Brown University. So let's start with the, the easiest way to understand a process is what are the toys that you can use in the real world to measure and quantify a surface roughness. Profilometer, this is certainly the most commonly used tool. Um, these people are probably here at the show. You could check them out. This drags a stylus inside of an arm uh, over a surface, and the little tiny needle that you see uh, on the right picture moves up and down with respect to that arm as it's drawn in and out, and it will actually profile the surface of the, of the um, part that you're looking at. And so you end up with this scratchy looking line, and that same, profi that same profilometer will give you numerical outputs. Now, if you have the means, I highly recommend picking one of these up. Um, the, a microscope or an interferometer, there might be some other techniques, but to me as an end user, uh, they're pretty much all the same. They allow you to do a 2 or a 3D version. You're taking an area instead of just a straight line to analyze surface uh, characteristics. These will have a 3D output, but nonetheless, it's, it's analyzable the same exact way as the 2D output would be. And uh, a big advantage of this type of system is that the area needed to take the measurement is quite small. And you can see this is, what, about 100, nanometer, 100 microns by 70 microns. So in inches, that's 4 thou by, say, 3 thou. So when you're trying to look at the surface roughness on a dental implant where you don't have a nice flat area to drag a, a profilometer stylus along, uh, this, this is used um, frequently. So either of these devices, either a profilometer or a interferometer microscope, um, outputs numerical data It'll give you an analysis of the surface. And absolutely the most commonly specified thing we see is RA. It's just surface roughness. It means the average distance from the mean line. Now, a downside of RA, which a lot of people don't particularly grasp, is that it doesn't really tell you anything about the surface other than how tall it is. All of those things you see on the right, they all have the same RA. And yet you could easily imagine that each of those is going to give you a different performance when you're trying to use it. If you're trying to use that top, very gentle sine wave to overmold, it's not going to be nearly as effective as, say, the, the second from the bottom. We'll get into how to control that in a second. Um, another thing that the profilometer can give out is the spacing, the SM value, which just indicates the mean profile spacing. So sometimes you want to make sure you have um, valleys every two microns, maybe five microns. It depends on your process requirements. And the last thing that they will give out is the developed surface ratio. So you can imagine that after you have hammered this target part with abrasive for some amount of time, the amount of area you have is greater than it used to be. So that's another way to quantify what has, done, has been done to the surface.